Uh, I do have another question for you. Uh, raise your hand if at the start of this year you had any sort of resolution. Raise your hand. There's got to be more than three of us. Any sort of resolution. Maybe that was some, a commitment that you wanted. The hands are starting to go up. Conviction's falling in the room. Transparency and honesty are falling in the room. The rest of y'all, we need to have a talk about improving your life. It's a great time to do this, and we'll talk about that later. But So those of you, I won't make you keep your, your, your hands up, but of those that uh, did a New Year's resolution, anyone still just rocking it out? See, y'all were bold with that one. Good for you. That's awesome. The people that didn't raise their hand for the first question knew that's where I was going. And so they're like, nope, I didn't lead. I didn't do anything. Nope. Uh, maybe, maybe this year uh, you had intention in your heart. I want to live my life differently. Maybe you said this was the year that I'm going to stop fighting with my spouse. And three hours into the year, your spouse had a problem. <laughs> this is the year that I'm going to do devotion every day before work. And then the early work meeting happened. This is the year that I'm going to spend less time on Facebook. And that post happened. And you just had to stay up to date with all the comments. Conviction really fell on that one. 31 days in from the start of the year, this is typically the time when resolutions get wrecked. And so tonight, I want to join you in the conversation and, and, and preach about what to do when that moment happens when your resolutions wreck. Would you join me in praying for the word of God tonight? God, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word. I ask that you would illuminate your word in our hearts. I pray that you would strengthen us. I pray that you would equip us. I pray that the words, God, that I say would be a reflection of you and your character. I ask that you would silence every voice of the enemy. And I pray that you would encourage your church tonight. Everyone said in Jesus' name. In a recent publication um, that I read that was absolutely sophisticated and 100% accurate on the internet, uh, I discovered uh, that people submitted some of their New Year's resolutions for 2024, and I got to say, some of them are absolutely hysterical. Uh, one person said, uh, and I have some of them here, one person said, it's my goal to read more, so I plan to turn all the subtitles on when I binge watch shows on Netflix. I don't think you think that thinks, I, don't, I, I can't even say that line. It confused me so much. I'm looking at that going, I don't think that's right. I don't think you can do that. Uh, another person said, my goal is to <clears throat> eat more tacos. I, I don't know about you guys, but that sounds like a really great goal to me. <sighs> Especially this week. Uh... Another person said, it's my goal to floss every day. And he, they clarified, the thing that you do with, on your teeth, not the dance. <laughs> if you don't know what that means, your life is better. <laughs> Another person said, stop Googling my symptoms. <laughs> If you've never done that, your life is better. <laughs> and then another one, last one that I saw, it says, drink more water and stop buying all the expensive trendy cups. Yeah, I, yeah, I felt a witness with that one. For all of you Stanley Cup lovers, I'm talking to you. Because last year it was the Hydro Flask, and the year before that it was the Yeti. I'm just trying to buy groceries. I don't know how some of y'all are affording all these drinks. If you don't know what any of those are, your life is probably better. 
So I got to be honest, I'm a little 50-50 on New Year's resolutions because of the high nature of, uh, in the business world, we call it a turnover rate or failure rate of New Year's resolutions. I'm going to get thinner this year. I'm going to get stronger this year. I'm going to cuss less this year. I'm going to whatever the thing is that we hear all, often talk about in culture. So many people start a New Year's resolution simply for the fact that it's hyped up at that time of year. However... I do think that it's a really good idea to read the Word of God and make a little comparison and contrast situation going on. Does my life line up with the Word of God, and how can, what can I do to improve my life? So when it comes to that kind of a resolution, I'm all for it, okay? So the definition of resolution is simply a firm decision to do or not to do something. And so when we look, when we look at the Word of God, it's full of verses like this. We see Proverbs 16, 3, that says, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and he will establish your plans. This is a firm decision. I, I've resolved in my heart. I've resolved that I'm going to do this. Philippians 3, 13 and 14 says, one thing I do, forgetting what's behind, 2023, forgetting what's behind and straining toward what is ahead. I think we felt this more in 2021 <laughs> than probably any other year before. It was like 2021 was the year that everything was going to change, but then it didn't. But in our minds, like, this is the year that it's all... So to, uh, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. So I'm going to leave behind the doom scrolling. If you don't know what doom scrolling is, it's, it's basically just when you get stuck in an endless cycle of like cat videos on, on, on YouTube. Anyone been there? If you don't, your life is probably. <laughs> so this is the year that I'm, I'm going to leave behind buying all the fancy new cups and I'm going to give a little bit more to missions this year. <laughs> if that feels like a strain... Maybe, maybe it is, straining toward what God is calling me to. So again, I'm 50-50 on New Year's resolutions if they work, simply for the height of it. But I am uh, for making assessments on our life to say, you know what, I need to pray more. I need to read God's word more. I need to have more godly fellowship in my life. I need to tighten up my language while I'm at work. I need to, to be a better reflection of Jesus in, in, at the gas station. I need to, all of these things... When we think of the word conviction, conviction is from God, and it's basically when God shines a light on our life to say, hey, that thing that you're doing, it's not really great. Hey, that, that thing you're watching, it, it's not really great. And w Would you watch that if so-and-so was in the room? And would you say that if, if Pastor Hoffman was in the room? And those are, these are the things that we, we feel this little check in our heart, and that's conviction, and it's from God. And this is why Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, uh, he wrote to the, to the Ephesians, I'm sorry, in, in Ephesians 4, chapter, chapter 4, said, you were taught, and no one ever starts a conversation with your toddler and said, I told you, <laughs> and I, I know I'm a new parent here, I have a three-year-old, but sometimes I have to tell Elsie more than once to do something. She's not perfect. I know she looks it, but she's not. But sometimes uh, God looks at me the same way. He's like, I thought I taught you. I thought I tried to. So Paul is saying, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off. Everyone say off. Your old self, which being corrupted by its deceitful desire, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on, everyone say on, the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, here's a couple things that I want to point out here. So we're being taught to put off our old self. But look at this. It's being corrupted. Like, actively. It's being corrupted, okay? So when we think about our, 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 our own corruption, our own evil desires, uh, let's be honest. Sometimes we like to blame everything on Satan, it's just easier to blame others, you know, it's, it's easier to blame Satan than to say, that actually came from my heart. When we see scripture and we, we allow God's word to illuminate the things in our heart that are not like him, it comes from within. It comes from within us. Now, does temptation happen from Satan? Yes, it does. Does temptation happen when you walk through the mall? Yes, it does. 
Does temptation happen when you, when you drive through the, the Lexus dealership? Yes, it does. But you also drove through the Lexus dealership. So sometimes we walk into it. So it says being corrupted by our deceitful desires, which literally means we're a train wreck waiting to happen. That's, uh, that's just me. I'm a train wreck waiting to happen. So on our own, Jeremiah said, our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Congratulations. That's you. But because of this, because, that, because we know that we are, we are deceitful in our, in our flesh, we know this, we have homework to do. We have work to do to actively put on the new self. We have to intentionally decide to do that because that new self is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. My flesh, when it wakes up in the morning, which is usually like before the spirit of God inside of me seems to wake up, that alarm clock goes off and like godly desires don't go through my head to be gentle and patient with the alarm clock. Malice, rage, anger is what I would tend to describe my relationship with my alarm clock. So I don't naturally want the things of God in all instances. My flesh is at war with the spirit of God that's inside of me. So I have to work to put off the old man and put on the new self. You know that you were taught to not say certain words. But then you got wrapped up into conversations at work and then it became normalized and then you kind of just got stuck in it. You know that you were taught that alcohol was not good for you, but then all of a sudden it just spiraled into something else and it turned into something else. And before you know, here you are. You know that you shouldn't have looked on that website, but it happened and here you are. And so, so Paul is writing to the church and he's, and he's saying, you were taught. But just because you were taught doesn't mean the work's done. You still have to try. You still have to work. You still have to you know, participate in God's process that he's trying to do in you. So this moment conviction sets in is when our resolutions, we realize that our resolution wrecks. Now, maybe you made up in your mind to fast this week and someone brought in Manderfield's Monday morning, doing the work of Satan. The first thing when our resolutions wreck, the first thing that we have to do is we have to assess the damage. Got to assess the damage. And sometimes the wreck is simple. Like you open your car door at Walmart and you hit the other car and you're just like praying to God, Lord, let this not be a Lamborghini. Let it be Pastor Hoffman's truck. Let it be, or let it not be Pastor, you know. <laughs> Wasn't making a comparison there with you and a Lamborghini. <laughs> But I've done that before when I, when I hit the car and I'm like, oh, Lord, like, I hope it's not bad. And then you go out there and you assess the damage and, Lord, let them not be in the car. Because it's about to get real weird. Because then I have to, like, explain. It looks like it's just fine. And you're like, it's totally fine. There's nothing, you know. So, but other times the wreck is a little bit more involved. And so we have to ask questions like, what's broke other than my wallet? Am I, am I okay? Did I hurt someone? Should I flee the scene of the accident? Should I write my number down, but one digit off? Don't do that. We are disciples of Jesus. I apologize if I gave you a bad idea. But when our resolutions wreck with Jesus, the same thing can occur. And maybe it's you ate ice cream and, and, and you forgot that you were fasting sweets that week. But maybe it's you forgot to pray that morning and then all of a sudden our spirit is entirely unhinged at work. And so we have to ask the same questions. What's broken? Did I hurt someone? Am I okay? Should I flee the scene of the accident and pretend like it wasn't a thing? In, uh, in 2018, there was a guy by the name of Patrick Reed who, was a, who is a professional golfer and uh, is in the golfing community widely known as one of the most hated golfers uh, in the professional sport of golfing. And I won't get into all the drama, but there's a few reasons why. However, he is a professional golfer and he gets paid more than I do to golf, which is zero. 
I actually pay to golf. Some people like get paid to golf, which is a really wild experience. So he, he won the Masters, which is a really big tournament in Augusta, uh, Augusta, Georgia, and it's a very prestigious event. And so he won the Masters, and just a few weeks after he won uh, the Masters, he, uh, by the way, he won a cool $1.98 million for winning that weekend. That's what I would call a good weekend. But in spite of being hated, he still did, he still did actually play. Um, and he won. So some of his earnings, with, with some of the earnings, he bought a, I want to show you a picture. He bought a car, and it's a pretty cool car. Um, I, I know what Porsche means, but all of the other numbers and letters after that, I'm, I'm sure some people in here know exactly what that means. All I can see is dollar signs. <laughs> it's a Porsche, is it a 9, 911, 911? I don't even know <laughs> what to call it. 9-I-I-L-L, I don't know. <laughs> I'm kidding. I kind of kidding. <laughs> um, so it's a Porsche, and it's a custom paint job, and it's a custom everything, and it's uh, approximately $450,000. That's an expensive car. It's a little bit more than my car. <laughs> so there is only a thousand of these cars made in the U.S., and his was the only car with this paint job on it because the colors of the masters are yellow and uh, green of this specific color. However, mysteriously, just a few days later, the car showed up on a salvage website and it showed this. Mm. Ouch. Uh, if I, first of all, if I had this kind of a car, I probably wouldn't have a driver's license. Um, this car, when it showed up to the, the, the wreckage salvage company, it had 360 miles on it. Not 360,000, 360. So when they went to assess the damage, this is what we could call totaled. Someone's going to buy this for scraps. Sometimes after a crash, it's, optimal, it's an optimal time to ask really hard questions. What happened, Patrick Reed? You know who is silent about this entire situation? Patrick Reed. Pretended like it wasn't, it wasn't even his, didn't, didn't own it, didn't come up and say what happened, but he got called out because someone at the company took down the VIN number and matched it up, and they said, yeah, we got you, and still was silent on it. But what was I doing when I wrecked? Why did I wreck? These are the questions that we have to ask ourselves sometimes. It's really easy to look at some of the fancy car and say, well, clearly, like, you made a mistake. But it's a little bit harder to look in the mirror and ask the same question. What happened? What, what did you do? Assessing the damage in our life might look like having a really hard conversation with ourselves in the mirror. If I continue down this path, where am I headed? Can I continue walking in holiness? Can I continue uh, uh, my path onward to salvation if I continue down in this path? What relationships am I going to wreck if I continue this way? Is my future in jeopardy? Now, when it comes to crash and burn kind of situations, I, there's, there's plenty in the, in the scriptures that we can look at. God likes to use broken uh, messed up people, and so I'm grateful to be used by God because I relate to a lot of people in scriptures. I, I actually saw a, um, a post a while ago, and it was a picture of someone like terrified, and it said, when you realize that you relate more, of the, more to the villains in scripture than the heroes. Like, yeah, that's, that actually tracks. <laughs> uh, but when I think about examples in scripture, I, I immediately think of Matthew 26. Jesus said to them, all of you uh, I'm sorry, Jesus is talking here. He's talking with, with his disciples. In verse, uh, Matthew 26, verse 33, Peter answered and said, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Talk about confidence. I mean, this guy's absolutely sure of himself. Verse 34, Jesus said to him, surely, nah, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Actually, Peter, here's what's going to happen. 
And in spite of the creator of the universe saying, as a matter of fact, here's what's going to happen, he, he pushed back even further and he said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. But as we discover his resolution, it was so clear. He was so clear. Let's continue on in scripture. Peter sat outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him saying, you were also with Jesus of Galilee, but he denied it before them all saying, I do not know what you're saying. And when he had gone out to the gateway, another girl saw him and said to those who were there, this fellow also was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you are one of them. Your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. His resolution crashed and burned. And I think, like, Peter, didn't Jesus literally just tell you, hey, you're going to deny me, like, in just a very short amount of time? Like, when that moment, like, happened, was, did he totally forget about it, or did he actively do it? He, I don't know. But the Bible tells us that he, it happened, and when it dawned on him, he cried and cried and cried. He took a moment to assess the damage. This is why Paul wrote to the Roman church, and I relate to this verse a lot. And have you ever looked at yourself in the mirror and said, why are you the way that you are? Maybe it's like after, maybe I'll just say me. Sometimes I step on the scale and I say, why are you the way that you are? <laughs> after I finish a nice meal, I'm like, why are you the way that you are? Paul's writing to the Roman church. He said, I don't understand what I do. For what I want to do, I don't do. But what I hate, now that I do. It's like when you're making your resolutions for the year and you're going to decide, I'm going to eat salads for the rest of the year. Every meal, breakfast included. Psycho. <laughs> so there's things that I want to do. I want to eat salads for the rest of the year. I'm not going to. Actually, the things that's really bad for me, that I'm going to do. Taco Bell, I'm there. <laughs> Why are you the way that you are? Paul was, was pretty consistent in leading the churches from a place of vulnerability. Writing to the churches, and he was honest about what he was dealing with, along with the, the instructing the churches on how to live a godly life. A little over a decade ago, uh, my, my family went through a very difficult season. Uh, Evelyn and I hadn't been married that long, and I had just become a youth pastor at ATC, and I started a new job. I was working at a nursing home. I was working like 50, 60 hours. Uh, that was new for me, <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was crazy. It was a crazy season, super exciting, but right in the middle of all of that, my parents' uh, marriage ended in a very bitter, ugly divorce, and it felt like my whole world came absolutely crashing down, and I, it felt isolating. It left me feeling vulnerable and embarrassed, along with a church that's hurting. And uh, my, my mom and I have, have resolved, and we have uh, come a long way over the years, and I love her dearly. And, but this was a season that I had, I had some realizations. I had some gaping wounds in my heart that were, that were undealt with. And I realized that I was spiritually hemorrhaging. And so as we are, as we are um, assessing the damage, sometimes we need to take a, a hard look and ask ourselves, where, are, where am I spiritually bleeding out? It was in this season that I realized that I was putting in a lot, but I was also losing a lot. I was losing a lot at home. I was losing a lot at church, but I was spiritually hemorrhaging because of hurt that I never found resolve on. I was spiritually hemorrhaging because of resentment and unforgiveness and bitterness towards a lot of people. I was spiritually hemorrhaging by not taking responsibility for my actions. And when we're spiritually hemorrhaging, sometimes we need to Sometimes it's not even do, making a long-term decision, but it's a, what, what, what can I do right now that's going to help me to not bleed out so much? So if, if you rolled up on the scene of a crash and 
someone is, uh, someone is bleeding out. If you're squeamish uh, on blood, sorry. Someone's bleeding out. Paramedic is gonna, gonna walk in and he's going to assess the damage. He's gonna assess the situation. I have a strong uh, belief that the paramedic isn't gonna look at you with you know, an arm severed, bleeding out and say, your cholesterol's a little high. okay, well, I'm going to be dead, so it doesn't matter. Um, he's not going to say, Seth, you are uh, got a bit of a weight problem. You should probably, no, no, like, just take care of my arm. I'm bleeding out. So in that moment, he's going to do something that to, to stop the bleeding. He's got to stop the hemorrhaging because you're going to die immediately in the next two minutes if we don't stop this. And sometimes when we assess the damage of our own heart, we need to say, where am I losing blood flow spiritually? Where am I hemorrhaging out? And sometimes we need to make a decision in the moment. I just got to get off of all, all social media entirely. I just got to cut off a relationship entirely. I can't be friends with them anymore. Sometimes it's, it's doing something crazy like changing jobs because I can't be around those people anymore. Sometimes it's making radical decisions to get back on track with your life. There's a season where I was so hurt and broken that I had to make some radical decisions with my walk with the Lord. And I, I, I stand here today feeling completely healed of the brokenness that was in my heart. I, I, I believe that whatever you're journeying through tonight, God is as near as the whisper of his name. And I stand here completely confident that whatever you're struggling with tonight, you can walk in victory. If you've struggled with alcohol your entire life, you can leave here full of victory. If you've been struggling with marijuana, God can give you freedom tonight. If you've been struggling, it doesn't matter what area you're struggling in, the healer's in the room. Victory's in the room. Salvation's in the room. So when our resolutions wreck, I say when and not if. When our resolutions wreck, because maybe I'm the only one, but there's been some times where I've had a conversation with Jesus that I've already had before. And sometimes I, I identify with Peter when I come to the altar and I say, never again. Never will I ever, or I will always, I will, remember how, how sometimes the, at, we go to marriage retreat, retreat and we hear things like, never use statements like you always, or you never, because it's typically not always or ever, somewhere in the between, but we make clear, clarifying statements with Jesus, never will I ever do this again. And we believe it, don't get me wrong, we believe it in that moment. But then all of a, all of a sudden, that thing wrecks again. And all of a sudden we find ourselves like Peter. Man, I feel so broken and discouraged because I, I, I told God this was the last time. This was the last time that I was going to say that. This was the last time that I was going to do that. So when our resolutions wreck, we have to assess the damage and ask ourselves, what happened? What went wrong? Why did it go wrong? And we have to address the immediate needs and stop the spiritual hemorrhaging. The last thing that I want to encourage you to do when a resolution wrecks, keep returning to the one who can fix what's broken. Keep returning to the one who can fix what's broken. A few years ago, I got rear-ended on the highway, and uh, thankfully everyone was okay. Uh, but I did have to go to the chiropractor a few, for a few weeks and thank God it was paid for. That was, that was kind of a nice side benefit. I got adjusted every week and someone else paid for it. It was, it was great. Don't know that I would have gotten the accident to do that, but here we are. But I also had to take my car in to get fixed and I couldn't take my car into the chiropractor. Multiple things were broken and so I had to go multiple places. Sometimes we need a mechanic, sometimes we need a doctor, sometimes we need a chiropractor, sometimes we need all of them. Sometimes we need spiritual restoration, and sometimes we need practical alignment, and usually we need both. Usually we need 
both. Sometimes we need a good moment at the altar where we bear our soul to Jesus. Most times we need an altar where we bear our soul to Jesus and we talk with someone who can walk alongside us in the journey. Most times we need a conversation with our Savior where we repent of our sins, but then we need to talk with a spouse. Then we need to talk with a mentor. Then we need to talk with a, a pastor or a boss. You see, I know, according to Scripture, I know Hebrews teaches us that we can approach God's throne of grace with confidence. This is what it says. Let us approach God's grace uh, throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. This is a biblical promise that we can always rely on. It's never running out. When you find a place of repentance where you say, God, this is the last time, we can come boldly to the throne with confidence. And I don't need anyone here to forgive my sins. I think you're a pretty great church, but no one here can forgive me of my sins. No, you, you're, you're pretty great. I told someone the other day, I think you're a really great guy, but I think you make a terrible general manager of the universe. Absolutely awful. No one here can forgive me of my sins. However, this is what I see what James instructs in James 5, 16. He said, confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be What? I've had conversations with a number of people in our church over the last few months about this, this concept and this idea. I maybe even have, have preached it here. I believe to my core that we can go directly for, to, to Jesus for forgiveness of sins. But I think sometimes we get locked into the same uh, habitual sin and the same things that we're chronically struggling with because we keep going here, up and down, up and down. Forgiveness of sins, forgiveness, asking for forgiveness, repentance, forgiveness, repentance, and we never go here. Because for whatever reason, if I'm really honest, this is easier than this. And so I carry the same burdens I carry the same weights because I'm chronically forgiven and not healed. Chronically forgiven and not healed. So could it be that God says, I want to use the body to heal the body? A few years ago, I was in a, uh, I've preached about the skiing accident before, and I I have a metal rod that's running through my entire tibia bone, uh, and so don't try to kick me. I promise I'll win. Um, after one of the surgeries, my, my, uh, after the first surgery, this, the swelling in my, in my leg, it continued to get worse. And they said after, uh, after a couple of weeks, it should get better, and it didn't get better. And so I consulted another surgeon, and he said, there's, there's one uh, screw that's in there that I believe is restricting the blood flow. And I believe it's because of this screw. If I take it out, the, your bone is strong enough to sustain it, but I believe the, the continued blood flow, the increased blood flow will bring healing. And so I was like, awesome, let's do it. So he went in there, took out the screw, and, the, the screw, and within hours, and within, within a day, 48 hours, the, the uh, swelling had gone down so much. And I was like, that is it. So I believe when we inject things into the body of Christ that shouldn't be there, it restricts the blood flow to minister to one another. Because the blood needs to be flowing among the body. It could be that our resolutions keep wrecking because we're only doing this and we're not doing this. I want you to hear me tonight. I'm not saying that anyone here uh, uh, heals anyone from, from, from sin. But there is healing process that the body provides. This is what scripture says. This is why Paul wrote to the Ephesians and he said, from him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament grows and builds itself up in love as each part does his work. This is why he wrote to the Roman church and he said, for just as each of us has one body with many members and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we through many form one body and each member belongs to one another. I belong to you, you belong to me. We are one body. This is why he wrote to the Colossians. It's almost like he had a trend here. 
It's almost like he had a theme. He wrote to the Colossians and he said, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart since as members of one body, you're called to peace. Do you see the trend here that Paul is bringing to attention? We need the body of Christ. You need the body of Christ. I need the body of Christ. It's so much easier to bear our burdens alone. In our minds, this is, what we, this is what the justification. I don't, I don't want to be a hindrance to anyone. You ever heard this? I don't, I don't want to be a bother. I can't fulfill scripture that says to bear one another's burdens when burdens aren't brought to me. You can't bear one another's burdens if no one brings you a burden. And so could it be that God designed you to bear one another's burdens? And so when we don't do that, we are not fulfilling Scripture. I want us all to stand tonight. When our resolutions wreck, assess the damage, what went wrong. Address the immediate needs. Stop the hemorrhaging. We have to be honest about what is hindering us. And we have to keep coming back. Maybe you've prayed for that thing a hundred times. Keep coming back to the altar. You may have a, lo a lost loved one. Keep praying for them. You may have a sickness in your body that you haven't been healed of. Keep praying. Keep coming back to the altar. Start that reading plan again. Start that fast again. Start that family devotion plan again. It's time for us to say yes to God again. Before I invite you to come down to the front and pray, I want to share with you a song that, that gripped my heart. And as you listen to the lyrics of the song, I want you to imagine yourself in a conversation with God. And maybe these are the words that you would say. I've carried a burden For too long on my own I wasn't created To bear it alone And I hear your invitation To let it all go I see now I'm laying it down I know that I need you so I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart needs a surgeon my soul needs a friend so I run to the Father again and again and again and again saw my condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart yeah I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand I can't comprehend All I know is I need you So I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father Again and again and again and again Again and again and again and again. I want to invite you to come down to the front to have another conversation with Jesus. If 
for all honest here tonight, there is a conversation that we need to have a second time with Jesus. Maybe that's your home. Maybe that's your kids. Maybe that's your marriage. Maybe that's your job. But there is all something that we can bring to the throne again. So God, right now, I pray that you would do a perfect work. I pray, Jesus, that you would do a perfect work in our homes. I pray that you would do a perfect work, God, in our minds. I ask, Lord Jesus, to do what only you can do. I ask you, Jesus, to do what only you can do. I speak healing in the name of Jesus. I speak restoration in the name of Jesus. come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus. Walk oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood oh, come. Oh, come to the altar, cause the Father's arms are open wide. And forgiveness was born with the precious blood.